and start the timer. We're off and running. Okay, so I wanted to talk about bookmarklets, which um, people used to use years ago, and youngsters these days have forgotten all about them or never even knew. So you know about bookmarks. You might have a bookmarks menu over here, a bookmarks toolbar if you uh, have need ready access to them. Um, bookmarks are URLs. Bookmarklets are also URLs, but they start with the word JavaScript, a colon, and then some code. And the idea is that when you select that from your bookmarks menu, it runs the code in the context of the page you happen to be viewing at the time. So um, you create one like any bookmark. In this case, I said just create a new bookmark, and then I typed in the text that I wanted to appear there, the code that I wanted to run, which is just the hello world, and then when I click on that, it runs. Slightly more usefully, um, in this example, what I wanted was a um, custom search. Now, obviously, browsers, you can select text, you can right-click and say search in Google. I wanted something better because in this case, if I search for these sorts of things, it turns out that um, W3 schools are really good at SEO um, and not really good at documenting things that I want to search for. So what I want to do is go to my favorite search engine and simply put the word MDN on the beginning so that I get uh, the search results um, on the MDN website, which is the place to go for that sort of stuff. So. To do that, this is the code that I would use. Get selection is just going to grab the text that's highlighted. Then I'm just make, you know, building a URL, um, including that query text. Now, if I take all of that and get rid of the new lines, all the spaces, and put JavaScript colon on the front, then you get this, which you can't read from the back, I'm sure. But that is a bookmarklet, and it works um, as shown previously. Here's another example. Um, if I was building something and I wanted to test it on, say, a mobile device, a phone or a tablet, once again, you can do that with browsers and syncing devices. But if you've got a stack of devices and you just want to load this page on that device, click the bookmarklet here, and up comes the current URL on the bookmarklet. It won't work if your URL is localhost. So to make that work, um, similar sort of thing, I'm taking the current URL instead of the selected text, but then using that, adding it on to the end of this URL, passing it to this public site that makes QR codes. Um, and then um, window.open with some size stuff causes that separate window to pop up. If you didn't have all this, it would just come up in a new tab. Um, and this void thing is this really weird thing that if you have some code that returns a value, the current page you're viewing is replaced by that value, which typically is square brackets object. Um. Another tip, you can create a script element, put in the URL of a script that's as big as you like, and then... Um, add that into your document, and your bookmarklet loads a script which has masses of code in it. So you can do that. Um, why is this? I was expecting to be out of time by now. Um, so the reason that I'm into this currently is uh, I'm working on building uh, the world's best Sudoku web app. Um, and one of the things I discovered in the community is that people share Sudoku puzzles as a string of 81 numbers, where the zeros are the blanks and all the others are the given digits. Um, and so you can plug that into a whole heap of apps. So what I wanted to do, I've got this great player, but I don't, don't have any puzzles. Um, I can, the, the point was I could read them from a newspaper and type them in, but what if I was on a website like the New York Times and I wanted to take that and put it into my superior player. So um, to achieve that, just throw some code at it, selecting stuff based on a class name for the board, class name for the cells. Um, in each cell, in this case, it's an SVG image, 
which isn't ideal, but they helpfully put an ARIA label on there with the actual digits, so yay for accessibility. Um, and then just join together those 81 things, slap it on the end of the URL, open it in a blank uh, a new tab, and you're away. Oh, because I turned off auto. That's why. Sorry. That was the discretion. <laughs> so if I turn auto back off again... Oh no, I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to mention this last one, different site I won't mention. I wanted to scrape it. I went into view source and found this, which is the solution. <laughs> <laughs> further down in, in the page, they had the same value again in a hidden form field, followed by another hidden form field with a mask to show which ones were given digits and which ones should be blank. So, that's me. <laughs> so, who doesn't have a Raspberry Pi? I decided to have a motion recorder and found a page that seemed to be easy. And thought, ah, you can keep an eye on the shared the neighbours used to borrow the hose and leave the gate open so the dog used to get out. It'd be good to be able to point at who it was. And then I found out the video was eight minutes and decided, nah. So just install it. And yeah, black screen. So I waved my hand in front and a white silhouette. Okay, so it's showing the movement and not the picture. Try and capture the camera footage. Um, outstanding quality there. Um, turn the setup mode off and you can't see six feet away or 20 feet away. It's all the same blurry shit. Found out the budget camera I picked has a tiny wee focus ring on the front. If you adjust that, you can actually see things. Doing that is after work. Light was getting a bit dim. Whoops, a daisy. I had to play around with the brightness settings. Still not ideal because you can't see things through the noise. Pointed out the front window when at home. Had the detection area right up big so it doesn't pick up the little movements. No, the pictures is all over the place now and then. So. It seemed to be a flash of a bad frame. Checked. How many frames is the trigger? One. One motion frame was enough. Turn it up. Seemed to help. Decided I want to be able to make the area smaller. Let's try and refine it based on a mask so I can see exactly where it wants to find movement and where it doesn't. Doesn't have a big enough area to pick up people anymore. Said adapt, auto adapt. Work it all out by your AIs. Eight out of ten for speed for detecting things. Red means ignore this area. Back to the same point again. Not detecting things or detecting everything. Various opportunities for expansion and doing it better, turning off your control so you can actually remotely look at the screen, because otherwise it's locked down to localhost. You've got lots of opportunities for extension, where you can uh, say, at the end of a movie recording, send it off. How do you want it delivered? What do you want to do once it's happened? <coughs> then came across this site. Uh, a bit better. You can do everything on it. Integrate your camera already, local devices, network devices, whatever. Tap the button for the video camera and see that and motion detect all in one open source package. Yeah, might get time to actually look at that one day. But yeah, wouldn't recommend the cheapest camera that you have in your drawer. But um, very good support from the... Um, 
Raspberry Pi on almost every USB camera I could lay my hands on since. Whether that's a little um, inspection cam, a little Microsoft cam, all seem to be fine. And uh, the QR of the Home Assistant, if anybody actually wants to find it without um, forgetting about the dash in the website name. And the weird I.O. on the end. Uh, that's from a demo site, so you can play with it all you like. I call that time. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Ah, uh, or the remote. Ah, oh, this is useful. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Alex. Um, this is a uh, somewhat reused slide deck from the Linux Conf AU presentation. Uh, there are two of them. If you find any of this stuff interesting, look them up. Um, everything's recorded on YouTube and the full slide decks are on GitHub and that QR code will take you there. I uh, hope you don't have that much time. So who am I? I'm Alex. I've been using uh, Cubes for dev sysadmin work for the last three-ish years over at Orion VM. Um, First off, has anyone actually heard of Orion VM? Yes, no, okay. Um, we're a wholesale cloud computing company, which is why we care about um, this um, threat model. So why is it that we need to protect sysadmins, which then brings up the question of why do you need cubes, given that cubes is a security orientated uh, distribution? And the basic idea is that it is becoming more and more profitable to go and exploit sysadmins using um, exploits that are easier and easier to go and get. So, what is Cubes? Um, it's a reasonably secure operating system, which is somewhat of an understatement. Um, it does security by isolation using Zen virtual machines. So the idea is that rather than trusting, for example, your Firefox, your email client, whatever, to be perfectly secure, because at the end of the day, anybody who's been on the security mailing list knows that none of those things are secure. Linux is, is definitely not secure. Zen is also not perfectly secure, but it's a lot better. Um, but what's very interesting is that it will secure both the applications out as well as things in. If you look down the bottom, um, securing USB devices and PCIe devices is a very interesting point that I'll hopefully have time to come up uh, to get to uh, later. Uh, is it usable? I would say yes. I'm somewhat biased. You should try it for yourself. Um, here's an example of a Cube's desktop. Uh, it looks fairly simple. Like, that looks like a standard Linux desktop, yeah? E everyone would go through and say this is basically what we'd expect, except for those bits at the top there, the brackets, the, ch the different uh, colored title bars. Those are different. What does that mean? So that uh, password manager and that Firefox are two different virtual machines. They can't see each other. They can't see the rest of the screen. And most importantly, one can't reach into the other one's memory and just steal all your passwords, which is nifty. And here's the same thing on i3, because tiling window managers are fun. So one of the major reasons why you want this is for network isolation. So if you look, you have Wi-Fi all the way over at the end. And as I very briefly mentioned earlier on, um, Cubes has IOMMU support. So the IOMMU is a firewall for PCIe devices. So it means that even if your Wi-Fi card itself gets compromised, it can't reach into, for example, your customer work VMs or what have you, and try and steal your SSH keys or gain access to systems that they're not meant to. Um, similarly, if you have, for example, this um, web browsing VM over here, um, and it's got some, some dodgy JavaScript or what have you, it can't just reach into your customer work environments and start doing fun things. So there's also this thing called the vault where you keep secrets and the like. It can't be seen either from a network level or even from PCIe devices. Um, there is this thing called VChan, which is like a Unix socket between these machines. It has an RPC framework that lets you kind of automate around that as well as doing access control. Uh, USB is a Lovecraftian nightmare. Um, Cubes makes this slightly better, um, especially because if you want to be a, um, a USB keyboard or whatever, you have to actually expect it to be a USB keyboard. You can't just randomly become a keyboard. And that's how that works. And as I mentioned before, hardware isolation using the IOMMU. Um, so that's a video call, but that is only accessible because you asked that USB camera to get passed into that cube. If you didn't do that, it couldn't reach out and steal your 
webcam. Disposable cubes are cool. They get shut down and destroyed after you finish looking at like PDFs or what have you. Convert to trusted PDF is built on that. Uh, did you know that printers update through printable documents? Does your printer have an internet connection? That's a management thing. You can run this on most standard Linux hardware. Intel integrated is best. Um, it's an open source project. Help is wanted. And if there's more information, look at those links. The boff was a while ago. And thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me okay? Cool, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the web aim million and making our web stuff more accessible with heart. Um, I say stuff because I keep saying websites all the time and people say, what about web apps? I'm like, I mean web apps as well. I just mean things on the web. Hey, that's me, so who am I? I'm Steve, you might have seen this. Um, I do front end dev and UX things. I'm working at Totara uh, down the road. It used to be upstairs, downstairs, upstairs in this building. Um, anyone else here a front ender? Ah, oh, yes, my people, great. Uh, everyone else might be slightly bored, sorry. So the web aim medium, what is that? It's this big ass accessibility analysis that a company called Web Aim did of the top one million homepages. Um, if you go to this URL, you'll see a bit more about what that means. What did they mean by top? Uh, why homepages, all this kind of thing. Uh, but broadly speaking, it's a shit ton of web pages and it's a good kind of thumb suck for what is the state of the web at the moment-ish. Kind of makes sense? It's a million pages, Woo. Okay, cool. And they did it automated. They didn't have somebody sitting, clicking through. That would have been, that would have been quite the thing. So what are some stats that they found as results from these million home pages? Um, maybe the scariest one was that they found that 98% of those pages had WCAG 2.0 failures. Does anyone know what this lovely acronym means? Yes, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. 12 points, thank you. Um, so the W3C's list of stuff that says, hey, if you would like to make your website accessible, because you love people like I do, then here's a list of stuff to help you do it. Um, does this seem like a big number to anyone else? Like it's a lot, right? No, no, small number? Could have been 99, yeah, fair enough. So basically, like it's a, <laughs> Fine, it was only a million pages, it was only home pages, but almost every page, which that seems like a thing to me. The other scary stat was that the average number of errors on each of those million pages was 60. 60, geez. So sure, it's an average. Some pages had a lot less, some pages had a lot more, but 60, I mean, you think about how many things are on a page, let's call it 30 thingies on a page maybe, and sure the DOM is a lot more complicated, but 60, seems like a lot. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um. <laughs> so I wanted to pluck out a few of the like, key errors that they picked up out of these 60. Um, so on the left here we have the error, what was the thing that was weird, and on the right, uh, what was the percent of the pages that had this error on them? Uh, empty links, 58%, I'll call it 60, I'm feeling, I'm feeling like rounding a bit. Um, empty buttons, 25%. So anyone want to take a guess, like, why, why would that happen? Like, you're not going to just write ahref and then stop. Like, why, why might that happen? JavaScript, JavaScript yep. Yeah, more, yeah, lots of JavaScript void watching you. Um, anything else? Images. If you've got an image that's wrapped in a link, if you've got a button with your image or an SVG inside, um, and that's all you've got, no text, you might end up with an empty link or an empty button if you don't provide any extra uh, accessibility goodness. So what that means is these links and these buttons are essentially invisible to people using any kind of assistive tech. Or it's like, oh, that's a link, where does it go? I don't know. That's a button, what does it do? I don't know. Doesn't seem like a great time to me. Another one which seemed quite, uh, quite a hairy one, about half of the pages on the entire web, bit of an exaggeration, bear with me, uh, are missing form labels. It's like a, a common pattern you might see a lot is like the search at the top of a thing, right? Your, your search, you've got your search ding, 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 and you've got your search button, and you've got a placeholder text inside the input, but no label. So what, why, why do we care? Same reason as the empty links and buttons. 
to anyone using some kind of assistive tech, it could potentially be an invisible thing. Like, there's an input. Type some stuff in. What stuff? I don't know. Uh, yeah. So there is good news. Uh, no, it seemed like a bit of a downer, but it's okay. We're coming back up now. Um, these were automatically detectable errors. You can run a tool to help them find, find these errors. One I particularly like is called axe at dq.com, where you can find it. They've got uh, a browser extension. They've got a command line tool. If you're using React or Vue, they've got a just axe uh, a custom matcher, which is great. Um, what else? Of course, it's slightly better to uh, avoid these errors in the first place. So if I stop, OK. Um, so it's always better to avoid these errors if you can. If you have non-text stuff images, make sure there's some text equivalent somehow. Uh, if you have formy things, always have a label, whether it's visible on the screen, yay, UX, or not. Uh, and if you remember nothing else, please remember DQ's axe. It will make your lives better. Thanks. Oh, hi, um, my name's Eric. I enjoy uh, listening to music and I uh, just wanted to, to share with you a cool tool that I've been using for, uh, for a few years. Uh, so, a uh, digital music player, I mean, why would anyone want this in this day and age where people only listen to music on their uh, smartphone uh, from a uh, streaming service or uh, cloud provider of any source? I mean, I'm m many of you are probably too young to remember, but there was a time where people li had these things called stereos, you know, this big bulky stuff thick cables, uh, loudspeakers uh, like this. I mean, I, I'm one of them and I like to listen to, uh, to music in my lounge on, uh, on my stereo. Uh, I was shopping for a s some sort of uh, open source solution and I, 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 I will share with you a, a good solution that I, put, uh, that I put together. Essentially what I wanted to do is have a good audio uh, quality, easy access to my music files I mean, not everyone's comfortable uh, having everything managed by uh, a cloud provider of sorts, uh, which control what you listen, which uh, record what you what you listen. So some some of you have maybe ripped their uh, CD collection and want to uh, to listen to uh, to it uh, as they please. And some of some of us still have the the concept of listening to a music album, you know, ten tunes from from the same album. So it's very old-fashioned. Uh, easy access to web radios and, and uh, a UI that would be uh, really reasonably simple. Uh, there's a, there's an it, uh, a very clever Italian guy who put together uh, a good solution um, based on the Raspberry Pi, which I will uh, explain a little bit later. Uh, so what uh, called Volumio, what's Volumio? So it's an open source uh, music player. So this is based on uh, a library called MPD, MPD for Music Player Daemon, who provides pretty much everything you would expect from a, uh, a digital music player. Uh, and he, he's done some, something clever. He has packaged uh, this library uh, into uh, a, Debian, uh, a Debian image, uh, which you can uh, flash and, and, and install very easily on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Um, he also has created uh, a very nice uh, web UI that you can listen to from your, uh, your uh, home network. Uh, uh, you can this you can uh, load this uh, UI from your uh, from your laptop or from your smartphone. I mean the, the UI is responsive uh, and really well designed, so it, it's it's really cool. Uh, you can mount uh, you can uh, fetch your music from uh, wherever uh, you manage it. So it could be a USB drive, uh, it could be a NAS location. Um, so in my case, uh, as you can see, I have connected uh, a non-powered uh, USB uh, drive uh, directly to the to the Pi. Uh, that's a, that's an old Pi B from a few years ago, so it still didn't have Wi-Fi, so hence the uh, the Ethernet uh, connection. Um, uh, most importantly, it has to support a number of DAX. A DAX is a digital to audio converter, so that's the thing that you need to uh, to convert uh, your digital signal to something that your stereo will be able to read. Uh, you can manage playlists. Uh, upgrade is fairly easy. Uh, 
uh, installation is a really a breeze. It's a really a reasonably well documented. So uh, you have to buy a DAC. That's really the, the central the central piece. Uh, I use a high fiber DAC, which is the the entry entry level uh, DAC. Uh, that's a Swiss company that does a really good job. Uh, so you plug this into uh, into your Pi. Uh, it's designed for the form, form factor. Uh, you flash a card, uh, you start it, you attach your uh, USB drive, you uh, connect your RCA cables, if you can find them now. Uh, you boot the Pi, uh, and then you find the dynamic IP address. You will want to, uh, to set it to a fixed IP address so that you can uh, program, you can create a, um, a bookmark uh, on your smartphone uh, because you, you will typically uh, read, uh, access your UI from a whatever browser you use on a, on a smartphone. You have SSH access. Uh, you have a plugin architecture. Uh, it supports uh, Spotify, uh, Pandora. Unfortunately, Pandora is no longer uh, available in this region. So use it and enjoy it. Thank you. This is a little bit different, um, coming back to the kind of doing good for um, New Zealand. Um, I love geospatial analyses, and over the last year, I started volunteering for a conservation group and doing trapping uh, for them every six weeks. Um, so I'm a data scientist, and they've got lots of data, so it was a great fit to try and help them get a little bit more um, from the data that they collect. Um, and the reason why they exist, for those of you who are not New Zealanders, is because of this fantastic vision. We've got to be predator-free by 2050, which is a lot of work, um, and that's mobilized people across the country to take off you know, time during the weekends and go and catch smelly pests and get rid of them, um, which is what I do. Um, I trap for the Remotaka Conservation Trust, who, um, if you guys know Wellington, they're out by... Wainu Yamada, and they're really cool because they've been going on for quite a while, and they've got some really great um, land that they manage through their trapping, um, through their trap network, including kiwis that they have managed to release in the Orongorongo. So it's really important for us to make sure that these traps are working and that they're regularly managed, especially through the mast year, which last year has been, and that means the um, native trees have been fruiting and seeding quite a lot and that massively increases the number of predators around. So it's quite crucial. So we go every two weeks for every trap line and that means for mine it's every six weeks where I actually go out into the bush. Um, so yes, kiwis, you probably won't see them if you go there during the day. You might have to go at night, preferably at twilight. Um, but yeah, so they're out there and the Nemotaka Conservation Trust manages um, about 500, maybe more, um, traps. So that's their network out there. It's quite extensive and it covers. These are just the stoat and rat traps that they've marked. They've actually also got possum traps. So we've got about 40 possum traps that we clear out as well when we go up. Um, so what is really nice with um, trap data is you can actually do some really great analytics on it to try and understand what um, what's been happening to the traps, what kind of predators are you catching, when you're getting more, when you're getting less, to so try and really tease out some of the insights of what environmental factors are potentially influencing um, the numbers of predators. This is a really great site by ERAT who are out in Eastbourne. They're a fully sort of community um, trapping initiative where people in their houses manage traps rather than what we do, which is um, volunteers heading out into the hills. And they've got this fabulous little dashboard that Rory, who comes to this meetup, has built for them. Um, it's really great. It's kind of, it's got a whole bunch of stuff above. It's a story of why trapping um, is important, and why conservation is important. And then at the bottom, it actually manages all the data that people send in from uh, their traps. But it is built in ArcGIS. <laughs> Um, and whilst they give you licenses for um, conservation groups, it's fairly limited and you, know, you kind of also to some extent limited um, in what you can do. And I am not an ARC user by any means. So I spoke to the people at the um, Conservation Trust and they said, yes, let's go for the open source solution, which is great. Um, and so that's something that I've been dabbling in. Um, there's a trap catch analyst already working for the Trust and she looks at basically stuff like this, but in Excel. 
Um, what I've been doing is helping out with um, visualizing and analyzing the maintenance of the trap. So you've got what the traps catch, and you've got a whole set of operations to actually make sure the traps are working properly, and they actually go out every other week, and they've got loads of jobs that they have to do, make sure that um, all the traps are in order. And the very first thing I did was just take some data, static data, um, off the fix-it jobs that they had, um, oh no, um, and put it in a leaflet map <laughs> and put it on an HTML page, which was pretty shit because it didn't um, live update. Um, and then I went to this talk, and then he told me about the Google Sheets CSV API, which I didn't know about. And so now I have a um, an app, which I'll just go straight to, it's deployed in Heroku, and it uses a bunch of Python packages to do spatial um, data manipulation, and it's all inside a Flask web app. Uh, it's very, very basic at the moment, and you'll see if you ever bother going to see my code. Um, but I did load it. I'm going to try and show it. Bear with me. So this is a horrendous app. Um, but it's cool because you can click on a circle and it tells you what needs to be done. And because it's a live connection to the Google Sheets database, it updates every time a fix it has been logged as finished. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I can't move. There you go. Still a work in progress. It's not at all usable even for the people that are doing the maintenance jobs. So there's a whole bunch of stuff to do, including building an actual dashboard. And I would love some help because I'm a data scientist, not an app developer. So if you've got any advice to give me or any suggestions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so I wanted to talk about code reviews. And this picture sums up what a lot of code reviews have been like for me. So if you look at the individual parts on their own, they're technically correct. Like, I can't really fault the antlers there. They're fine. <laughs> well, yeah, OK. Um, but when you put, look at the whole thing put together, you're just left asking yourself, why? What, I, what are you trying to do here? Um, and that highlights for me the most important thing that we should be looking for in code reviews. Is it understandable? Sounds crazy, right? Um, but I'm not talking about understanding like any one line of code or any given function, but seeing the whole change set, how it fits together, and understanding why it's needed. And that's important because that understandability is the hardest thing to fix once the code's been committed. Um, you can fix a bug or make it run faster, easy enough, but you can't wave a magic wand and make the code um, more understandable. I find when I look for the understandability of the whole change set, I tend to spot bigger problems. Um, you know, you can spot things like where did the user requirement for the antlers come from? Um, you know, all that power pole code, perhaps it's not actually needed in this case. And you can um, give the developer feedback on how their code would be more readable. Like, you know, maybe calling this package electric moose isn't the most descriptive name. Maybe we could think of something better. Um, and readability is something that we should all be working towards because that's our job. Our main audience isn't the compiler or a computer somewhere. It's the other developers who have to come along later and modify the code that we write. And if they can't understand the um, code that we collectively write, the, it's not maintainable. It's, um, we're not really doing open source. And I think a big part of our job is taking comple complex ideas and communicating them clearly to other people. And that's something that's really hard to do in, in code. And the only chance that we really get for feedback on how well we're communicating is the code review. Um, and one thing that makes that really hard is if you go into code review thinking that your code is already perfect, it doesn't need changes at all. 
um, and that's just a frustrating experience for um, everyone involved. I, th I think it, it's easy for us to kind of have a bit of a cognitive cognitive bias where we think we're better than average programmers. Um, you know, of course the code I write is understandable, it's the code everyone else writes, that, that's the problem. Um, and yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the thing is, it's just part of human nature. Um, I think it's the same as how 80% of um, people think they're better than average driver. Um, the problem is statistically we can't all be better than average and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being average. I mean, by definition, most of us are. Um, there's a bunch of industry best practices there to take you know, average developers and elevate them to really great programmers. It's up to us whether we choose to use those or not. Um, and yeah, Kent Beck put it nicely. Um, if we choose to use these habits, then we can um, work to make the code even better as um, part of code review. Uh, I think I'm just gonna stop there. Thank you, Tim. Hi, I'm Tom. Um, I am going to be referring to my notes down here a little bit, so I might be looking down here a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm Tom. I got a new job recently. So um, in literally every interview that I had with the people who now employ me, which is that guy, um, they wanted a, a lead developer, someone who would sort of be, sort of become custodian of the main code base of the or the main backend code base of the project. And the one thing that every interview I had, they kept saying was like, we need someone who like take ownership and push through some of the nice to haves like code formatting and and black and test improvements and stuff like that. And that was really kind of handy because it meant that I already had spelled out for me something that would be like an easy win in my first week on the job, like without having to know much of anything. Um, so. Before I go any further, who here does Python and who knows what black is? Cool, enough of you. Um, black is an opinionated code formatter. It takes the code you've written and it reshuffles it around, it fixes the white space according to its decisions to what your white space should look like. Um, it conforms to a pretty strict set of rules and you don't really get to configure those rules. Uh, so just for some really quick examples, this is not a talk about black, this is a talk about reformatting a giant project in black quickly. So it'll take like that, do I have a laser? I like lasers. Um, and it'll reformat like that. It'll make sure that your arguments aren't spilling off the edge, it enforces line limit things, it puts the bracket down there. Um, and one of the interesting things about black is it's not very configurable. You might not like the little sad face here, the little bracket there, <laughs> but um, that doesn't matter because it's not your problem anymore. When you're writing code, you can put that little bracket anywhere you want, and the formatter will put it where it belongs. So, <laughs> so the it's not necessarily it's not necessary that you have to agree with every decision that Black does. I like most of the way it formats code, but not necessarily all of it. Um, but the good that it's doing you is that it's taking the cognitive load of formatting out of your job. So you can save your energy for the hard problem in computer science, which is naming things, right? You, you, you take all the energy that you spent formatting code and just named your variables better, you'd be a whole lot better off. I'm really grateful to be going after Tim because this is a code quality talk. You know, uh, Code is for humans. So I decided that the first thing I would do is get black running across our entire code base. And happily, I already had buy-in for most of the team. They all, they'd all heard of it. They all kind of liked the idea. Um, and I was in the unique position of knowing a lot about Python and knowing a lot about programming and knowing a lot about black and knowing nothing about what we did as a business and knowing nothing about our problem domain, not having a clue about everything we actually do, which meant that I was the only developer who wasn't really busy on the stuff that we actually do. And I had the headspace to do the thing that is just good code practice. 
So this was in the lead up to Christmas, and literally only the work I could do was the stuff that required Python knowledge, but not knowledge of the business. We were closing off merge requests. We were like finishing things up. The, the, the code review queue was shrinking. So now was the time to sort of push through one giant change that would change all of the code. So you get buy-in from the team, and I kind of already had that for free, which was nice. Um, but there's a couple steps that you have to go through. I am going to have to talk even faster. And I'm, I, I'm talking fast already, right? Yeah, cool, okay. I have to speed up. I'm sorry. Um, it's really important that we are not adding more work to our developers. So making sure that the editors are the things that are doing all the work was key before you even try and push a change like this through. Black is integratable into basically every editor that everyone uses. That's a subset of them. Um, so making sure that every time you hit save in an editor, it would just reformat the code so that you don't need to be thinking about you know, where that bracket was going to go. Um, on top of the editors, making sure that it's really easy to set up a pre-commit hook that also just checks before you commit the code that it, it conforms to the format and reformats it for you. Um, so I ended up making sure that this was just over-documented in all the little configuration files that it had. So here's the configuration file for black. And the good thing is that all the code editors use this uh, configuration file as well, sort of explain why we chose some of the very few configurable things that you can choose, um, configuring the target version, making sure that it was all pretty obvious what was happening there, adding a contributing file that actually explained like how to get this set up. Um, this is about to go gong, but I have about another minute of stuff that I need to do. So I'll just talk even faster. Sure. So a little bit before Christmas, uh, what's that? That's like the day before we finished uh, for the year. Um, I committed the, the black, ah, go back. So in my first week on the job, I wrote 41,000 lines of code, apparently, <laughs> which <laughs> makes, you, makes you look fantastic, right? Um, but there's actually a real problem with that. And anyone who's tried to do like a project-wide code reshuffle or refactor knows this problem, which is you lose all of the history, right? You lose the history in Git. So suddenly it looks like I have actually written a ton of code when actually I haven't. And that means that when you actually need to know who wrote this so that you can ask them, like, what's this do? Like, what am I missing? You, 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 most projects don't do something like this because that history is actually really important to preserve. So it took Git many years, but actually they've solved this problem now. So if you didn't know this and if you have a formatting issue or you want to do a major refactor, here's what you need to know, which is, as of recent versions of Git, Git blame and Git annotate and the tools that like do this sort of annotated analysis can filter out the revisions that do giant changes you don't care about. So if you're using version 2.23, you can add this um, command here, which will filter out that revision from Git blame. And you can also configure it in a file. So the last piece of this puzzle is having something in your repository that actually explains how to filter out that one commit from all of your code analysis and all of your Git annotations so that it's not clogging up that history. Um, and then the other step was in that Git message here, which is when someone hasn't configured that, when they see my name splashed all through the code base, what they'll see is a commit message that says, hey, to get rid of me, go look at this file. You go look at that file, and it has the explanation for what you need. It has installation stuff here because if you're using Ubuntu Bionic, it actually isn't a recent enough version of Git, so you just have to go to the upstream PPA. Um, but yeah, that was basically all I had to say. Um, yeah. Um, I had this great plan. I, I found this um, this great article I read, and it was about comparing USB-C chargers and the, the processing power that's in USB-C chargers to the computer that's in the Apollo 11 that went, that went to the moon. And they, they worked out that actually there was more, more processing power in a USB-C charger. And I was going to do a great talk about it. <laughs> I didn't have time. So I'm just going to talk about it. <laughs> Say what? That's it. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs>
great, 24 seconds. Um, so I thought I'd talk about some stuff that I've been doing recently that I know a little bit more about, um, a little bit more prepared. Uh, prepared. And so it's sort of like two, two main things. One of them is, is about databases and one of them is about tests. Um, both of them are about developer experience. And um, these, these two things uh, have been particularly problematic. Um, Tom's come along and, um, and he's been really vocal about making the developer experience better and it's got me really motivated um, and so I've, I've also been like pouring in a little bit of my extra time to try and ha help that situation along. So one of the problems we have is that we have this like um, sanitized database. So our production database I think is like a six gig dump or something. And we have this process that strips out all the personally identifiable data um, but retains kind of largely the structure of the database which is really useful for development against. And, and that database is around two gigabytes now which means that if you restore it, it takes at least five minutes on a reasonably good machine. And that, that gets painful, especially if you need to restore it, try something, go, oh, it didn't work, restore it again, try it again. And so what we really want is we want really easy access to, to data that looks like production. We want no way to, to leak private or sensitive data um, from a developer environment. So ideally, no sensitive data or, or private data would ever get to a developer environment. And I'm happy to say that we've actually done very well at that. Um, and we also want fast access and restore times. And so these are some ideas. We haven't yet tried all of these out, but I, I've certainly prototyped them all, and they have various levels of success. So turning F-Sync off, um, I'm pretty sure anybody that's used Postgres will tell you that's a terrible idea, but um, it does speed things up somewhat. Um, <laughs> um, so I had to play with ButterFS. ButterFS is fantastic. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, it's a file system that allows you to do like um, copy on write snapshots. Um, and I just experimented with literally restoring the database, doing a copy on write snapshot, and running a, a Postgres instance on that. And then every time you want to make a new one, you can just tear it down, make a new snapshot, and start it up again, which is pretty quick. Um, Tom actually had the, the great idea of like, whenever you create a Postgres database, you, s you can specify a template database. And uh, when t t Tom just started doing this, and um, I had thought about it before, but I'd, I'd never realized how much difference it was going to make. And we managed to turn like the five minute time into like, I don't know, 40 or 50 seconds, which was a considerable improvement. So that, that, that was another great option there. But if anybody has any really good ideas on, on how to speed this process up, I'm really interested in hearing about it. The other thing that we're talking about was testing. And Tom's been, Tom's been really, really um, vocal about, um, you know, this. So we, say what? I'm enjoying this stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, basically, m my, my takeaway was writing tests should be easier than, than manually clicking around and testing something. Um, to Tom's line was, tests should be a pleasure to write. Um, but they should be really simple to write. They should run really fast. And where we were at was really poor test coverage, which I'm happy to say we're pretty much still there. Um, but we're getting better. Um, but the tests were slow to run. Like it, it took up to 10 minutes to run the whole test suite. Um, and if you wanted to run like a single test, like if you're working on something and you just want to run like a couple of tests, you know, it was at least 20 seconds to run a single test. Um, and most of that was due to like um, spinning up all the test database, um, you, you know, basically setting up the harness, you know, then a couple of seconds actually running the test and then tearing it all down again. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's sort, of a, sort of explaining that. But these are the things that we've done probably over the past couple of weeks that have really, really lifted that game. So. The, the 10 minute runtime has come down to about 30 seconds. Um, that's a combination of, um, uh, maybe I won't explain all these things in great detail because I'm short on time, but, but we, we started by, instead of creating the data set, the test data set from scratch for every test, we just created it once and used the, the Postgres template thing. Uh, that sped it up a lot. That, that meant it only took like, you know, a couple of seconds instead of 10. Um, and then, Various iterations happened until we found this thing here, and if nobody has ever used this, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, if you have tests that commit code, that's fine, because what this thing does is like wraps the whole thing up in like a transaction, and then makes all your commit, be two seconds, all your commit and rollbacks become like um, save points instead. And so you can run your whole test in a transaction despite the fact that it's doing commits, and it just sort of simulates the whole thing for you. Um, but li literally in the past couple of days, I've been writing code. Uh, the test has been running like super fast. 
and it's a, it's actually been like a real a real awesome experience writing code um, and and actually having tests working on it. If anybody has any thoughts about how any of this stuff could be better, I'm I'm going to hang around afterwards. I'm really really keen to hear your thoughts. I think that's me. So um, my name's Ollie. Um, this is my talk. Um, right. So this is perhaps a counterpoint in some ways to Tim's talk and Tom's talk. Um, this is a quote from Blaise Pascal, who was um, perhaps a computer, sci a computer science pioneer in some ways. He built a very early um, mechanical computing device about two centuries before Babbage did. Um, and the quotes, well, as you'll see, it's somewhat appropriate to this. Um, so back in my third year in university in the early 90s, um, me and a couple of friends doing the same course, I was a mathematician at the time, and we were all on the same staircase. Um, I was on the top floor. Um, as a result, I tended to pop in on my way up the stairs, see what was going on. David was my supervision partner. And David and Martin had this... Um, I suppose brilliant idea of trying to write the world's best one-line program. Um, so, Pearl Mungus regulars may recall I've talked about this before, but um, I got a bit obsessed again. So, the, the courtyard was named after um, William Huell, who was um, he was a, a, a scientist, and um, I think he would be more famous if people could pronounce his name more easily. Um, he actually coined the term scientist. Um, and he's quoted in um, Darwin's, in the Origin of Species, is quoted at the start. So the machine we were targeting for this was the Acorn Archimedes, which had a dialect of BASIC, BBC BASIC 5. Um, it's a machine which uses an ARM processor. So that's the same ARM processor, essentially, that's in your, almost certainly in your smartphone. Um, back in those days, the ARM stood for it. Acorn Risk Machine. It was later rebranded and spun off as Advanced Risk Machines. And the parent company, Acorn, um, is no longer in business as for decades, probably by now. Um, so they say don't fill your slides with code. I put my entire program on a slide. Um, don't try and understand it. That's not the point. It's basically gibberish anyway. Um, but I'll just point out a few things about it. It's 255 bytes of tokenized basic, so things like repeat, go sub false for each one byte, because they're one token. Um, it's really hard to type in like this. <laughs> so what you actually do is type in a, about a nine line program, and then run a little script which goes through and removes all the spaces, because you need some spaces to let the tokenization work, and joins all the lines together. And then you can save it, and you can run it, and so forth. So this is the original version which David and Martin wrote with some assistance from me. And then I took that and decided it didn't have enough features, and I came up with this version, which, well, again, it's gibberish, but you know. So the added features are, this one has scoring, it has a drop key, it has a game over message, which is implemented in two bytes, colon Z. So one of the error messages from the BBC Basic Interpreter is mistake. And this triggers that. So at the end of the game, it says mistake. Normally, it would say mistake at line 10, but we carefully put a program on line 0. And there's a special case in the error message thing. It doesn't report line 0 because that's how intermediate word mode works. Uh, it also fixes two bugs in the original. So the precursor to the Acorn Archimedes is the BBC Micro. This had a 6502 CPU, which runs at 2 megahertz. So that's about a 1,000 times slower than the CPU in your smartphone probably does. It had 32K of memory, which is about 10,000 times less memory than in your smartphone. Um, oops. And a very low resolution, not many colors. So can you do a BBC Micro version of this? The problems are these parts aren't in the earlier dialect of BASIC, BBC BASIC 1. Um, and because it's all rather intricately in intertwined, changing those causes a lot of problems. But you can do it. Can I get the mouse cursor over? Oh. 
So um, I'll just need to put my microphone down a moment. So this is taking advantage of a BBC micro emulator which is written in JavaScript. <laughs> because I'm going to just ignore that, sorry. Um, so this is actually a cycle accurate emulation of the 6502, uh, which takes advantage of some work some people did where they cut the top of a 6502 processor and scanned it. And then they did lots of clever stuff to turn that into a model of how it actually works. Um, I kind of rather love that the technology stack here is just insane. So this is the program as it's in fact five, six lines in this case. And this is the magic to turn it into one line. And that's my one line program. Oh, I need to click on the thing. So here we go. Oh, let's get ready to play. So it's a little bit flickery because this machine's quite slow and there's no drop key, so you have to just wait for the. <sighs> um, so this version, it has scoring as a whole new scoring algorithm because I couldn't fit the old one in. Um, it has, it doesn't have all the blocks. It only has uh, four blocks, but it has all the different shapes apart from a square. It doesn't have a mirror square or the mirror versions of the L. And this is as fast as it goes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually see the algorithm it's using for drawing the pieces here, which is that it, it draws round in a sort of like a petal, like a square of the corners cut off. And I think so. I mean, it says here it's running at 2.2 .2 megahertz, and I believe the BBC Model B is 2 megahertz. So it's 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 very slightly faster, if anything. I haven't. I don't have a real BBC a hand to try it on. Unfortunately, mine's still in the UK. Um. Oh, oh, oh. <sighs> Should I keep playing until you can see it clear a line? <laughs> so you, you've actually seen it clear a line because the, the line at the start, the loop at the start, which clears the board, is actually the same as the line clearing thing. Which is, is um, it probably would. So the one of the problems is that the cursor's not turned off because in the Archimedes version that was just two bytes colon off, but that's not available in this version of BASIC. So in this version of BASIC, you have to do. VDU twenty three comma one semicolon zero semicolon zero semicolon zero semicolon zero semicolon zero semicolon, which is quite a lot of bytes to just turn the cursor off with. <laughs> just realised I should put it that way up. So um, while we're waiting for this to, <laughs> while we're waiting for this to, thank you, Grant. While we're waiting for this, I'll just mention there's, there's actually a longer talk I gave um, in about 2011 about the original version of this, um, which is 30 minutes long. That's available on YouTube, and there's a link in the slides to that. I think it probably depends who's playing. <laughs> um, so the original version was called Realism, which is an anagram. Well, it's not an anagram. It's, it comes from the letters in Martin and David's surnames, Moore and Hollis. Oh, it's not going to work, is it? You never get the piece you want. Uh, 
So it doesn't have this version. The original version did. This version I've had to. Can I? Yes, I can. So this version is missing the square, and it, it only has one kind of chiral form of the zigzag and the L. Hooray! <laughs> and it's missing the end game message. I'm just a little bit over time, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> no, no, that, 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 that hitch says escape because I pressed escape, pressed escape. I didn't have enough bytes in this to fit the end game message in, I'm afraid. Um, so how do I get back to. I guess I can control W. No. Oh, yes, leave, uh, leave page. So, um, in summary, and that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I went to it over time. Hi, I'm Reed. I work for a company called Animation Mentor, and we have this tool that is sort of like Facebook for artists or animators or something. And um, trivia note, uh, Brenda Wallace just came to work with us, who I think everybody knows. Um, but the problem we had to solve was our production system had thousands of files. Some of them are very tiny, some of them are very large. These are things like videos someone might upload. Some of them are very tiny files that we care about the content of them. It would be great to have those in our QA system so that we could test and do things only that's expensive, it's a pain in the ass. We don't want to have to move a few terabytes of files every few minutes. Um, and so I made a thing which scans the set of files that exist, makes a little file which is just a list of files with the name, uh, the content type, and the size. And then there's a another tool which reads that file, creates the 600,000 files, but in a fun way. So if it's an image, you get a little image that looks like that. So in our QA system, all the images look like exactly like that. And if it's a little file, it just, it just embeds it. So we've got some small files that have a little configuration that's useful to have. And so in our QA system, when it wants to read one of those files, it can actually do it like it's on a production system. And that's really it. Um, Go's fun. You should use Go. It's sweet. Um, <laughs> it's, um, no, that's really it. Okay. What he's doing is not really related to what I'm doing, but I don't have any, um, I don't have any, uh, slides because I wasn't going to be talking this morning but uh, this afternoon at four o'clock I was like I've talked at every single one of these before so I feel bad I want to talk so I'm going to talk about something um, I'm apparently good at so people have told me I'm good at documentation um, I don't believe I'm good at documentation um, but other people uh, I know are not good at documentation Mostly, <laughs> <laughs> mostly because they don't do it, they don't just don't do anything, and occasionally because they write some and it really sucks. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the notes because this is what I wrote at five o'clock today. Um, so, yeah, I was once employed to even write documentation, so, you know, Somebody gave me some money to do that. It was by these people over here a little while ago. Um, anyway, so the first rule of the doc documentation for me is write documentation for yourself. So why I'm supposedly good at documentation is because I know that I'm going to forget how to do shit. So I forget how to do stuff. So what I want to be doing is writing down what I need to do the next time I encounter that problem. So I'm writing documentation for me in six months' time or a year's time, especially when the, hit, the shit hits the fan, 
I need to fix stuff really quickly, or somebody asks me how to do this, it's like, that's what I write documentation for. Um, I'm writing it so that I can bootstrap myself. Now, there's certain people who just don't feel that that's necessary at all. Um, there's, there's a guy over there, it's pretty much that guy. He, he just backs himself to remember it or Google it and he gets there. And that's great, but it only helps him. Um, it doesn't help other people. So a kind of side benefit of writing good documentation for yourself is that other people can use it if you, if you write it in a decent way. So how do I write the documentation? Um, so basically I churn out docs because I know I'm going to forget. That, that's why I do it. Um, so how do I write documentation? I write documentation in the style of, I don't know if anybody rem remembers the Pearl cookbooks. It's like, I want to know how to do X. It's like, I have problem X. So I just have these massive lists of like, how do you do this? Um, I try not to be like, make it a big epic. It's like, let's just focus on I want to do one thing because often those things are, comp you know, you can compose the one things into bigger things. But if you try to write this like big documentation thing about, uh, and the other, the other benefit of writing small modular chunks is that it's really easy to do it. It's like you just add a new one and then you commit it and, um, and, and it's, it's like, it's just really approachable, really easy way to get, get going. And you're really just r writing little bit pieces that you can put together to get your job done. Um, so yeah, essentially I write cookbooks. Um, I write about, about how to do something. It's like, I have a problem, I need to do X, how do I do it? I explain that. Um, and so when doing that, it's really important. I call this the Goldilocks thing. Yep. Um, Goldilocks. So essentially, you want just the right amount of uh, information and context, right? So you, you stick to the how. You don't try to tell this big story about why you're doing the thing. I've, written documenta I've read documentation where people are trying to explain all of the stuff about why, like the context. Why did we do this? Blah, 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 blah. Like normally, you just want to know, I've got a problem. Tell me how to solve it. So it's really important not to miss out any steps. It's like missing steps in documentation just are really bad. Um, but you don't want any extra stuff. You want to just get just the pertinent information for me in six months' time when I'll get this problem again. I want to be able to find it. I want to be able to, so searchability is really important. I want to be able to find that thing. Then I want to be able to follow the instructions and I'm done. That's what you want to do. And so um, uh, also, a lot of the time, actually, you can just write. I'm a, I am actually a programmer, so it's not. I'm not just writing the documentation. So a lot of the time, actually, just write the script that just codifies all that shit, and then write the documentation to point at the script. Also, write your scripts to have good, um, good help options. So write your scripts to be self-documenting. Um, when you write dash dash help, your script should tell you how that works. Um, and then you should put all of the stuff into Git. Um, that that going back to just just sticking to really small self-contained problems means that you can form a habit. You can write a thing that says this is how I do this. You commit it, and then it's just a habit. It's just like oh, I, I did a thing, and I wrote the documentation because it took me an extra two minutes, and then I committed it, and then I just carried on. And it's like so I just do that as part of my workflow. It's just like do stuff, document, do stuff. Um, put it in Git. So maybe your company doesn't support that. At least like a wiki is close to that. You know, for a long time I did this stuff with a wiki, but you know, using source control and all that stuff is good. Um, yeah, and so to summarize, write it for yourself, write how to's, <laughs> be concise, don't waffle, no missing bits, form a habit, and use Git. <laughs>